Thank you, Bernie. Um, and thanks, Suzanne and the organizing committee for inviting me to participate today. Um, one of the things I wanted to raise today, I hope it doesn't come across as a gigantic wet towel, but I want to raise a whole different approach to the idea of changing behavior and whether it's possible. And I want to do that by talking about responsible guardianship in Costa Rica. Um, by the way, uh, in the program, it says I'm at Northwestern University, where I would love to teach, but I'm actually at Northeastern University in Boston. Um, I also took on a recent job at a group called Forensic Veterinary Investigations, which I like just because now I can tell people I'm an FBI agent. So um, back to responsible guardianship. Um, the current thinking um, among animal activists who are involved in this sort of work is that you create a series of interventions, some of which have been talked about today, to change behavior. You do empowerment training, consciousness raising, humane education, um, with the goal of trying to change behavior that's reasonable. Uh, but I'm gonna look at this question sociologically and say, well, is that going to really do anything at the level of a culture, rather than eight people, 1,000 people? If you wanna make a sea change, a normative sea change in a culture, what does that take? Now, to look at uh, how innovations change cultures, um, Andrew Rowan and I have talked about this, and when I hear people talking about the use of interventions like consciousness raising, information giving, it's a bit like thinking that you change behavior by injecting people. Um, in this case, in terms of responsible guardianship, what are you injecting? Well, you're injecting things like humane education, consciousness raising, to either do one of two things, either to vaccinate somebody to prevent them from becoming irresponsible guardians of dogs, or you're giving them some sort of antibiotic with the injection to take away that behavior. But nothing in sociology tells me that this is how you change cultures. The injection approach doesn't work in a large scale sense. In fact, what we know from studying the diffusion of innovations, which is going to be the theoretical approach I'm taking today, partially because I think it's so relevant to this entire discussion, the conference, and it's rarely brought up. Uh, diffusion innovation theory started in the 1950s, mostly looking at the diffusion of pharmaceutical innovations in America, but it spread to looking at technological innovations and social innovations as well. Um, when you look at this literature, um, it, what it does is have you focus, it's almost like putting on a different pair of glasses. And instead of looking at individuals, you're looking at culture and you reverse the question. And then the question becomes not do these interventions like consciousness raising, which by the way, I'm not belittling, I think they're part of the big picture too. But rather than looking at how they change culture, if they do at all, you have to ask what's culture gonna do with everything you're bringing in? And that's what I wanna focus on today. Uh, and by the way, I have to acknowledge that when I've talked to uh, friends and colleagues who are in the field doing uh, 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 these interventions, to the one, they acknowledge that culture is obviously a real force that you contend with. What I'm gonna argue is it's a far more dynamic, complex, and unfortunately unpredictable force in affecting behavior change or not. Um, now, to look at this question of how does culture change innovations, I'm going to be using Costa Rica as a case study, and I shouldn't be doing this, so I'll go home now. I shouldn't be doing this because the study isn't starting until November. And so what I'm talking about today is really a theoretical framework for why I think uh, responsible guardianship is either going to diffuse or has been diffused in Costa Rica or has not. Um, and to do that, I wanna, uh, first of all, um, thank a few organizations very quickly, HSUS, Pegasus Foundation, and the Food and Nutrition Resources Foundation for allowing me to go to, to Costa Rica November 1st, and I don't know when I'm coming back. <laughs> um, initially, I'm planning on going until at least February or March for the first two runs, and I may continue for another year if I can support myself uh, on the project. Um, what I'm gonna be doing, as Bernie mentioned, is an ethnographic study, and I don't wanna spend too much time at the front of the talk talking about the method, because then I'll never get to the meaty part of the talk. And if anyone wants to hear more about the nitty gritty side of ethnographically what I'm doing, please catch me in the hallways. I'm gonna be using a method called rapid ethnography. Um, but one thing that's important to acknowledge here is that all ethnographies <coughs> are case studies. 
So I'm not generalizing anything beyond Costa Rica, and I realize that many of you here are involved in countries that have absolutely nothing in common with Costa Rica in terms of its socioeconomic status, uh, cultural position, modernization. It's a whole different ball of wax. On the other hand, at a more general level, I think the Costa Rican case still makes the point that I can make in almost any culture, and that is you gotta look at social context to understand whether whatever you're doing is going to not just be adopted by an individual, but will have what we call social traction, meaning they're gonna do it over time, and ideally spread the word or become a disciple. So let's look at the, this case. Um, what I want to start with very quickly is uh, to set the stage by looking at what has happened in Costa Rica <clears throat> uh, at the governmental level and the NG NGO level in the past 15 to 20 years. Costa Rica is really a remarkable case study. Uh, since the 90s, they've uh, banned uh, the use of wild animals in circuses. They've banned hunting as a sport, made poaching illegal. They've tried to close all zoos in the country. Now, it sounds like there are a thousand, two zoos. Uh, they tried to close the zoos and make all captive animals that are wild no longer cageable. They failed doing this one measure, but then the zoos made radical changes in how the animals were kept. The government's still pursuing this as a line of action. The government also has created a number of regulations aimed at dog owners, including you have to have your pet vaccinated, you have to provide a healthy lifestyle, which is an interesting set of words, for your dog, which includes things like walking your dog regularly, and you, you're liable, according to government regulations, and you could be fined for letting your dog run free. Now, it doesn't that sound great, except none of them are enforced. Um, but the belief is that, especially among uh, animal activists I've spoken to in Costa Rica, that this is such a strong statement for the government to make. It's an important measure, even if it's not enforced. Uh, NGOs have been very active in Costa Rica as well. At a few different levels, um, HSI and SINASA is one of the two largest animal protection groups in Costa Rica. And together, they've created opposition to dog fighting, <coughs> promoted the humane treatment of farm animals, sought to protect wildlife, and supported an animal shelter. This is a shelter south of San Jose. It's in San Rafael. And that's where I'm going to be staying for five months. No, not in one of the cages. <laughs> but on the grounds, uh, well, I'm hoping I will, will be adopted, but I'm a <laughs> difficult case, bad behavior. Um, there also is another organization, there are 40 actually animal protection groups in Costa Rica. ANPA is the second largest. And these other 40 organizations have mostly done humane education, free or low cost spay neutering and freer low, low cost, <clears throat> excuse me, veterinary care. So, so what's the outcome? You know, why am I using this as a case? Well, anecdotally and with survey data, uh, there's some convincing, not so strong evidence that responsible guardianship is having traction there. Anecdotally, the reports say that uh, over the last 20 years, owners of dogs seem to be putting them on leashes more often, they're keeping them in their homes more often, and uh, importantly, they're interacting with strays differently. You hear fewer reports anecdotally of people abusing strays or ignoring them as though they don't exist, and now they're more likely to interact with them in positive ways, feed them or play with them. But these are anecdotal reports, but I'm the last to criticize anecdotal reports as an ethnographer. Uh, survey data is also very positive. Uh, and before I talk about the survey data, is anyone here involved with any of the surveys that have been done in Costa Rica? You have? But were you involved in the survey? Yes, I worked for the there. Oh, so then you can fill in all the blanks yeah. that, oh. ask her. <laughs> well, there have been three surveys, right, that I'm aware of, uh, done in 2003, 2011 by WISPA, and then, uh, which is now WAP, WAP, World Animal Protection, and then a third one done in 2015 by the university. Um, they're all done uh, to look at two things, animal dog condition and uh, attitudes of owners toward responsible guardianship. And this was done only in the greater metropolitan area of San Jose. Um, the surveys, 
I applaud people who tried to do the survey. It's an immensely difficult job. One problem in looking at the surveys as a form of longitudinal data is a number of the questions aren't repeated, and the wording is different. So it's very difficult to draw firm conclusions, but it's suggestive. This is all having fun today, in a way. So the data suggest what? The data suggests that responsible guardianship is happening in the following ways. The data, if you buy into the survey data, show that owners seem to be allowing dogs to stay in the homes for longer hours, more days. Uh, more people are playing with their dogs. More people are taking dogs to the vets. Dogs are living longer. Dogs are more likely to get daily water. They're more likely to be seen as companions rather than guards. And people even know there are regulations that are encouraging responsible uh, guardianship. So then where does this put us? If anecdotal data and survey results, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't keep up with the slides. Um, there's a man happy with a dog. Um, what does this mean? Well, uh, when I, I have to say, when I do my ethnography in the coming months, I'm going to focus primarily on Ticos. Ticos is the colloquial term for native Costa Rican. But I'm also going to interview and study animal activists, because I think they're a part of the ethnographic picture and an interesting part. And I've been doing Skyping, Skype interviews. I, I'm anxious to get the study going. So even though it's not supposed to start until November, I've been interviewing people since February. Um, <laughs> and uh, one of the things that's pretty clear is that when I talked about these anecdotal results and survey results, activists are very quick there to claim that their efforts are accounting for these changes. Now, I understand psychologically why that would happen. And in fact, it, they, it, they may be right. But sociologically, I would say, wait a minute, that if we're trying to explain these alleged changes, uh, they may be due to things having nothing to do with humane education, with going into, uh, pr uh, into the hillside to provide spay neutering, providing free veterinary, it have nothing to do with that. There's an alternative hypothesis, and that's what I want to put on the table today, that just be careful if we're trying to explain impact and its source, where it's coming from. Um, what I'm going to have us refocus on today is uh, the context that surrounds an innovation and the person who's targeted for the change. Um, the diffusion of innovation literature says, and it sounds counterintuitive, but it says an individual is more likely to change, you'll be able to predict that, by looking at the person's context more than whether that individual is willing to change or is, has the capacity to change. And that, you shake your head when you hear that, but I can give you numbers of examples where there was no change until the, the context was targeted for change. There are a couple of possibilities for how social context can do this. And I'm going to first look at what's called macro social change in sociology. And then if I have time, I'll look at micro changes uh, in terms of facilitating or not uh, responsible guardianship. And there are bunches of bunches, lots of possibilities for how these macro contextual changes can affect behavior. One is, <clears throat> and this is the extreme argument, is that no matter what's going on on the ground with animal activists in Costa Rica, some of these alleged changes in uh, responsible guardianship may have occurred even if an activist never set foot in Costa Rica. That's an ex extreme argument. Two other possibilities, I'm sorry, I'm still going through puberty. Two other possibilities <laughs> <coughs> are uh, that it primes people. So you have a larger social change and it gets people prepared to then accept this new behavior. Or the third possibility is that it reinforces whatever that new behavior is. So there are different ways that context can, can have a, a, a force in, in changing behavior. What I'm going to look at is modernization in Costa Rica first to talk about an example of how this macro change can occur. And by modernization, we're talking about the transfer of, of Western or modern practices and ideas to another culture and specifically looking at how modernization may have contributed to these anecdotal and survey results. By the way, I should add, I'm not up here advocating for modernization. I'm, as a sociologist, I'm usually up here critiquing it. But I am arguing that it has to be considered as a force in whether, at least in Costa Rica, change has occurred. So what are some examples of modernization in Costa Rica that may be linked to these changes? One is urbanization. In 1960, about a third of Costa Rica was considered urban. 
uh, as of last year, about 70% of the country is urban, which is really a huge change in a relatively small historical period. Uh, why is this urbanization, or why might it be linked to responsible guardianship? Well, one factor is if you look at the age, average age, mean age, it's gone radically down as the country has been urbanized. So you have a much younger population in cities. Why does that matter? Well, when people, sociologists have looked, and there actually is an anthropologist who's done this, who's based at the University of California, San Diego, that along with becoming more a younger population, the younger population is more interested in what? Uh, emulating a Western lifestyle. So what do you emulate? Well, people first think you emulate pop culture. That's what always gets in the news, right? That people like our popular culture, but they hate our politics, which actually I feel too. Um, what happens here is part of this Western culture that's being emulated is dog keeping and pet keeping. Uh, I like to throw in pet and not just say dog because I'm a cat owner and I, cats always get secondhand treatment in these discussions, but cats are there too. But it's dogs that are interesting to people as part of becoming more Western and modern, right? And part of becoming more Western and modern, uh, according to anthropologists, is not just having the pet, but incorporating it into the family as what we take for as a member of the family. That's radically different than the typical Tico pet, which in rural uh, Costa Rica is, uh, birds are really the number one pet to have. And when dogs are owned in rural T Costa Rica, they're often 50% guardian and 50% pet. In cities with the younger population, they're, they're sitting at the dinner table, right? Now, along with the age shift as part of this urban shift, you have two other factors that I think could be related to the adoption of responsible guardianship. One is <clears throat> income that you have a rising income to the point where the World Bank now considers Costa Rica a middle-class country. I have a house somehow to show that's middle-class. And increasing literacy rate, which is quite remarkable. The literacy rate in Costa Rica um, over the past 20 or 30 years has been aggressively pushed by the government such that it's 95% now, which is, by, I think Guatemala is 25% by comparison. The U.S. is 84%, so it's incredible and if you compare uh, the gains in a short period of time, both in income and education. So what's again the link to responsible guardianship? A couple of things. One is expendable income. You now not only have, because of the age change, people interested in incorporating dogs as family pets, but then you have the expendable income to possibly pay for veterinary care. And I wanted to add, and I have to jump ahead because I changed my talk three or four times since we sent it in. Uh, so this should, I'm going to come back in a second to migration. Internet access is part of this rising educational, uh, uh, an educational attainment in Costa Rica. Um, and this, I think, is also linked to the possibility of the, the, the diffusion of responsible guardianship. <clears throat> in Costa Rica, let me back up a second, the number of people who have internet access is 88% uh, of the country. And again, this compares to 84% in the U.S., so it's actually a little higher than the U.S. Now, why is internet access possibly related to responsible guardianship? Well, if you follow the logic, Peter Singer wrote a piece a few years ago about globalization of farm animal welfare concerns. And he argued that the biggest force in, in mobilizing global dissent about the treatment of farm animals was internet access that you had people who were nowhere near ever seeing the treatment of farm, uh, <coughs> farm animals, excuse me, now seeing it online and also seeing how to do something about your protest online. Again, what's the connection? The connection is if you have a country that, that it's 88% online, you also then have a means to educate people about things like what constitutes the mistreatment of dogs and even more so when you get down to the management of strays, you have Facebook pages for the adoption of strays. And if I have time at the end, I'll show you how they've actually created, one of the shelters have created dedicated pages on Facebook to individual dogs in an animal shelter and how they create biographies around these animals and apparently have, have astronomical success with adoptions. So internet access is also p potentially part of the sea change in, uh, uh, in, in uh, responsible guardianship. A uh, final factor in uh, looking at modernization as an example of how context can influence responsible guardianship is migration and tourism. Huge change in Costa Rica in the past couple of decades. Uh, a lot of migration from Europe, US, and Central America. Uh, 
um, to the point where this city is known as Gringo Central by locals. I'm not sure if that's positive or not. Um, ecotourism is uh, probably now a bigger source of income for the country maybe than even coffee production. So what? Okay, it's, people are migrating there, lots of ecotourists. The so what is this. You now have more opportunities for very simple social, social psychological experiment where you have role modeling all the time that's in a natural environment. You have people interacting with both dogs they may bring or adopt there in a different way that people might be accustomed to seeing. Or you have people interacting with strays in a different way. And the Ticos theoretically have a way then of not only observing a difference but then emulating it. In addition, it was pointed out to me by one of the people I was interviewing on Skype is that their rate of tourism of Ticos going overseas has increased. So they can also make these observations in other countries and potentially bring them back to Costa Rica. So uh, if I shoot ahead, uh, <clears throat> these are all just examples of how context can facilitate responsible guardianship, but context can do the opposite. It can prevent it. Um, and there are a couple of ways it can prevent uh, change. According to innovation diffusion theory, and this is, uh, this is the wet towel part that I think is interesting to consider. Everett Rogers, who is the founder of innovation diffusion theory said, and there's there 40 years of data to back this up, is that when you have a, an innovation, a non-technological innovation, a technological innovations compared to ideas and behaviors spread quickly. Among the Anamami Indians, camcorders when they were big spread within a month and were fully used by them. Although not the way you predicted, they weren't used for making family films, they used them to protest government action against them in the creating of reservations. So it was interesting how they adapted, which is also a lesson in innovations don't stay the same over time once locals get their hands on them. Rogers said that when innovations are accepted, they're accepted in the beginning by what he called elite adopters or early adopters. Um, and he claimed it was a personality issue, which I think I can't believe he did this, and I can talk a little bit about why I think that's so wrong. But the problem is there's a sociological wall after this initial, we're on board with you. The problem is, uh, in looking at something like 400 studies of ideas that have been diffused, that number, the percent of early adopters is 20%. Um, where are the other 80%? The other 80% Rogers called, oh no, I pushed the wrong button. Oh good, it didn't blow up. Uh, laggards and non-adopters. These are the people who aren't on board. Now, this is where Rogers blames it on personality. These people aren't flexible, they're inflexible, they're not going to be able to, and there may be a role for that, but again, I'm a sociologist, sorry. For me, to explain this 80%, you have to look at, again, these larger social factors that may account for who's buying into this and who isn't. Interestingly, if you look at other uh, behaviors in Costa Rica where people have tried to spread them, um, they've only had partial success. Uh, birth control behavior in the 90s was diffused in Costa Rica with some success. They had elite early adopters. When they looked at who adopted birth control behavior and who didn't, areas of Costa Rica that had been modernized were the heavy adopters those that weren't modernized, and we're getting my point earlier about modernization. So it may not be a personality issue, it might be what's going on with larger social forces. Um, the fact that there are many resistors of innovations, though, tells me it's not just due to larger social changes that may get people primed or not to change. It also it has to do with cognitive culture. Um, this is called microculture, if any of you took Intro Social 101. You probably still owe me a paper. Cognitive culture, it's also known as ideational culture. These are the ideas that are shared among a group of people. And I believe that the ideational culture, the idea culture in Costa Rica is a factor in resisting responsible guardianship. How? These are again theories. Call me back in a year and I'll tell you, hopefully I would be invited back, whether any of these really worked out. One of my theories, and this is not purely a theory, it's based, I've had about 15 interviews on Skype, which is nothing so far, but it's something to work on. That many of the people who I think might be resistors of responsible guardianship have what I would call a liminal view of dogs. What's a liminal, liminal view of dogs? The Western approach, the Western ideational culture about strays is that we, it's a dichotomous view. We have pets and strays. 
not a lot in between, right? Uh, that's presumably a stray. Now, the, the issue with strays and pets in a dichotomous view is that pets have a place, right? They belong in someone's home. If they're not in the home, get them back in the home or get them in a shelter where they can be kept temporarily until they're back in the home. If there's a stray, it's out of place. It has no place, right? And we want to manage that dog to give it a place, get it into a shelter, maybe adopt it. But it shouldn't just be roaming. I don't believe that Ticos, especially those who might be resistant to responsible guardianship, have this dichotomous view. They have a liminal view. What's a liminal view? Liminal view is not dichotomous. What it is is you see something living on the cracks. So a stray dog, if you see it liminally, is a dog that is, yeah, it's someone's pet, but it really isn't. It's kind of civilized, but it really is uncivilized too. It's familiar, but not really all that familiar. It's, it's a mess to someone who thinks dichotomously. But the point is, if you think liminally, what would appear to us as a series of contradictions are th simply contradictions that are lived with as a normal feature of life. Uh, preliminary interviews that I've had suggest that Ticos, many Ticos have this view of strays as sort of having a place and sort of not. It's not either or. What's interesting is, uh, two of the activists that I spoke to on the phone who are animal rescues, rescuers in Costa Rica themselves had this liminal view that yes, the dogs are just a natural part of the landscape here and they're not viewed as problems. And th that requires a little more explanation. Uh, one of the other elements of cognitive culture that I think it's a play here as a resistor to responsible guardianship is seeing the dog from the dog's perspective. Now again, from the Western approach, um, if you talk to people about taking the dog's perspective, if it's a stray, typically people will focus on the dog's suffering, potential suffering. I would too. The dog looks like it has malnutrition. I have a picture here which I want to get by quickly. It's all right. We'll get by that quickly. The dog suffers. It looks sick. It has disabilities. It has disease. It's unhappy, whatever projection unhappiness means, right? You're taking the dog's perspective. That isn't what I think happens with many Ticos which doesn't mean, by the way, they're callous to suffering. Instead, what I think happens, again, based preliminary, a preliminary observation based on interviews I've done, a couple of things. One is um, dogs may be seen differently in terms of their nature. And I've heard this from a number of people where the idea of roaming is seen as part of the dog's nature. Um, and not only is it part of the dog's nature, but I had several people express to me that they felt like it was cruel to use a leash. And I remember I took them back and I said, I didn't hear that. I, I thought, Are you, you're beating the dog with a leash. Merely controlling the dog with a leash is a form of cruelty because you're inhibiting the dog's nature, which is to be free. That's a very powerful belief that I don't think is easily shot down or changed with an alternative set of beliefs, especially when it's reinforced with other beliefs such as this one about the dog's perspective, which is it's natural to be a nuisance, which is what my father told me as a child. But in this case, the nuisance is it, if you perceive it natural for a dog to, to not only roam, but to knock over trash, to defecate wherever the dog might want to, to bite people, if that's normal and, and part of the dog's nature, how likely are you going to then adopt responsible guardianship behaviors. And the real capper is this one. And this is, I think, the most fascinating one, is I think there's increasing perception among Ticos, and I understand why, that not only is it the dog's nature to roam, it's dog nature to the animalitos, to have a good time and destroy things, but the dogs on the street are happy. This is the killer. And I think, ironically, why might they be perceived as happy? I can't wait to interview people. This is an ethno I know you're thinking the guy's crazy. Ethnographically, I love this sort of thing. That what constitutes happiness may be due to the success of spay-neutering programs. That I think the very fact that there may be fewer dogs on the streets, and those that are on the streets may, in fact, be healthier, they may be perceived as looking healthier and happier, and they may, in fact, be. But the point is, it may make no sense to people to say, control your dogs or control those dogs in the street if it's their not, all not, not only their nature to be there, but they're having a good time and they're fine. Uh, last example of cognitive culture, if I have time, is devaluation. This is a fun one, too. Um, uh, typically in Western cultures, right, you have this opposition of strays and pedigrees, right? Stray pedigree. One is valued more than the other financially, but also 
uh, in terms of how an owner views the dog. Is it worth my time, worth my effort? This is certainly true in Costa Rica as well. Strong preference for pedigrees. This is probably true in, I don't know if there's any country where it isn't true. Uh, the problem here is that uh, if you want to expand responsible guardianship to include strays, how do you pump extra value? How do you raise the value of strays relative to that of pedigree breeds? so that people might be more interested in expending time and money uh, on strays. Well, one possibility, and this is what I think I mentioned earlier, is uh, a group called the Land of the Strays. You could, uh, if you put it in Google search, they have some videos oops, um, that show you their operation. They have about 900 to 1,000 dogs at any one point in time. It's a free roaming shelter, I'm, so the dogs are not caged. Uh, there have been some charges off the record, so you're not going to share this with anyone. <laughs> uh, off the record, I've been told that there's some concern that they're actually incipient hoarders who are running the shelter, and this is something I'm going to look at. But I think in terms of revaluing strays, what they've done is brilliant. These two pictures are strays, and I don't know if you could read their names, but what they've done is they take each stray and they look at a parent, you know how you could do this with dogs. It's got the, the head of a Doberman and the tail of a Chevrolet. I, you, you pull it together. And what they've done is to create for each dog its own kind of complex individual pedigree. And the one that was the biggest success was one dog that had the name the Alaskan Collie Fluffer Terrier. I keep wanting to say Fluffer Nutter. And it became a Facebook sensation. I think it shut down Facebook. There were so many people entering the site. They created billboards with this one dog advertisements, they made money through advertising the dog, and they had television appearances for the dog. Now, according to the Land of the Strays, and this is something I'm gonna to try to confirm, their adoption rate, they claim, went from an average of about 10 a month before they did this uh, pedigreeing uh, of zaguates, which is mongrel, um, went from 10 dogs a month to 150 dogs a month. Um, the other thing that's going on there, and this is something that just came up in the last couple of weeks, that I want to look into is that there is some uh, animal, there's one animal rescue group that's trying to create biographies for individual strays. And the thinking there is how do you, if right now, if you think of strays, they're often depersonalized, unless you live in a neighborhood where you see the same stray over time. That often isn't the case. So what they've done is to create stories. The stray, he lived out here in the woods and he has friends or she has friends. And they create these stories of just a few to break the public's perception, cognitive culture, that they're all strange, that in fact they have histories, that they have siblings and families. And I want to follow this up and see potentially how successful this has been too. So uh, how do I wrap this up? Um, whether you're looking at cognitive culture as a way that uh, the diffusion of responsible guardianship is blocked, or if you're looking at how macro social forces like modernization facilitate responsible guardianship, either way, the bottom line is social context will, in some way, it has to in some way influence the adoption of any animal welfare intervention. Now, understanding this connection between culture and the adoption of innovations, I think should set some agenda for future research. And I am an academic, um, and I'm interested in promoting and encouraging research. Uh, one of the things I would like to see happen is, and I only focused on one side of this, is if macro social forces are considered, one should look at both how they facilitate change, which is what I looked at today as an example, but also how they can impede it. There are two sides to this. For example, um, I have an anthropologist friend who's in the Dominican Republic now, and he said in, in what he's looking at is a, a different diffusion question, but he said in the village where he is, uh, there's a kind of hostility to any kind of innovation that's brought in that smacks of modern Western uh, lifestyle, the reverse of what I was talking about among urban ticos. Now, if something like an animal welfare intervention, if this is the case, is perceived as smacking of a modern Western be set of behaviors, there's a potential for it to be rejected outright. And so it can work both ways as a facilitator and impeder. Same is true for micro social forces. They can facilitate or impede. I looked at impeding today. But a good example of, of facilitating is something called glocalization. Glocalization, I think a good example of that is the uh, land of the strays example I gave you of trying to take local knowledge, which is they prefer pedigrees, and trying to capitalize on that and rebranding. That glocalization is using local knowledge, right, to 
um, customize an innovation and make it something that locals can feel like it's theirs. And the more uh, behavior is, some, is owned by a group, the more likely you'll have traction with it as opposed to just imposing it. Um, so I would uh, encourage that as well. And for me, what does the future hold? <laughs> Sounds so bad. The future holds uh, many months in Costa Rica where I'm gonna do two things. I'm hoping to first look at how Ticos interpret here uh, and translate the messages about animal welfare change, specifically responsible guardianship. Um, and then secondly, once I get a sense of how and what factors influence how they understand it, urban versus rural, I want to especially go, by the way, into modern neighborhoods where people are not accepting responsible guardianship. It's the reverse. And neighborhoods or areas that have not been modernized where they've accepted it to look at what factors seem to influence that translation of the message, how it's translated, and then finally, what's the outcome? Is it an outright rejection, ignoring, or adaptation to that? If I'm alive in a year and back from the jungle, I hope I'm invited back again to participate in this wonderful conference. Thank you. <clears throat>